<laughs> I am totally not trying to do this here. Um, <laughs> but let's go on to the second segment of our lecture. So I, I just got done explaining how to calculate the average value of any function over a distribution. So again, the, the general term, I guess we're calling that is a moment. Um, but so specifically, the reason why I bring that up is that the next question that we're going to ask is not necessarily what is the center of a distribution, which as you see, we can describe as a median or an ex expect expectation value or as a mode. So rather than talk about where the center lies, let's talk about how spread out that distribution is around its center. And to do that, we're now going to invoke some things that we're going to call variance and deviation and standard deviation. Um, so terms you've heard of. So this is probably where you, you may not have seen some of these equations, like even if you've had some of these uh, uh, courses before. So with that said, the, the, way the, the, the question we want to ask, and, and again, I'll just kind of diagram this, is you have some distribution, and in our case, it's kind of a histogram type of thing like this. I think that's more or less a representation of our data here. And pretty clearly we can see it lies at a center of 10, is where that value is. And it has kind of a tail that goes left and a tail that goes right. The tail that goes right is a little bit broader. The tail that goes left is a little bit steeper. And by the way, this can, this is, we can see here, if we kind of make a, a continuous function on top of that, that I didn't really do that very well, but the, the tail on the right-hand side is a little bit longer, and it drops off a little bit more steeply on the left. And that's why the expectation value, or the average, is shifted over just very slightly to the right, because we have a slightly longer tail to the right than we do to the left there. And by the way, when you're calculating, for example, like class averages on exams, it comes up all the time in education, um, one, of the, one of the ways to tell basically kind of where, how, how, how well the class is understanding stuff is to look at the deviation between the median and the mean, or the average. And lots, so one example would be, let's say the, the class average is 75, the mean, but the median is 80. What that means is that an equal number of students got below 80 has got above 80, and that's typically the better way to gauge how well the class did. How well did the most average person of all the most averagest persons did? <laughs> um, so equal number got below 80 is above. So that's typically what most professors would use as kind of like the, you know, if they had to, to um, what was it, um, scale the curve, they would set it at uh, the median value. Now the fact that the average was lower implies that the tail on the low end was very long. You had, you know, students getting 75, 70, 65, 50, 30. I've gotten students gotten 22%. So you have a very long tail on that end. But clearly, there's not very far you can go on the top end. You, you can only do 20% 20, 20, uh, 20 or 20 points higher than 80. But you can do 80 points lower than, than 80. Um, so if you have an average below the median, that implies that that low, the, um, the tail on that bad side was much broader than the tail on the good side, if you will. Um, none of that we're going to need to worry about here. But in describing this, though, what you can ask, regardless of how well those match up, is how far on average was any student from that median or, or the average value? In other words, how wide is that distribution? So um, in courses where basically everyone is at very close to the same point, you might have a, a, a mean of 80% and a, an average away from that mean of maybe only 5%. So basically, almost the entire class got within five points of 80%. Um, that implies that basically no one is exceptional, no one is very bad, and that's actually a really fun environment to learn in because you're all at your own at the same level, you know? <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, on the other hand, if you have a, a mean of 80 and a, and a average spread of 15, that means that you have a very wide range of students getting everywhere from typically, you know, like 98 to, you know, 50 to 40 or so. And that spread is a much more challenging environment to teach and to learn in because you're all at very different points. 
So basically the question we're asking here now is how tightly packed is that distribution? And to answer that, it's going to be a little bit more complicated than just the functions that we've already created, but we will stick with almost precisely the same notation. So first, one way that you can consider asking this is for any given j, what is the average distance of that value j from the average j? And notice that I'm, I'm uh, editing myself here. Instead of saying what's the distance from the average, I'm saying what's the different distance from the expectation value. Now, the easiest way we can write that is, let's just, again, we'll take a, a given j, and let's see, let, let's write it as delta j, and let's just take that j and subtract from that the expectation value of j. Again, that, that's precisely the same thing as what I just wrote there. So this is a very well-defined thing. Now, you can calculate that for each of our, in, in our case here, what is the average deviation of all the kids who are eight from 10, two years old? The kids who are nine from 10, that's one, obviously. And by the way, this is 10.05, so we need to be a little more careful with that. Um, the kids who are, the, the deviation of the kids who are 10 is only 0.05 years from the expected value. So one way to think about what is the average spread is literally just to average that deviation. And so this is why I, I kind of went to lengths to describe the average of any function based on that value as the, the sum of that function times how likely it is. Because we're going to do precisely that. We're going to create a function that says what is the average or the expected deviation from the average. And I know that the definition sounds a little bit strange, but mathematically it's extremely well defined. So when you put brackets around it, we can forget everything else and go straight to our formula of calculating that. So I'm just gonna substitute instead of f of j, I'm gonna substitute delta j. So we're gonna sum over all j's of delta j times the probability of j. And now what we're going to do, we're going to take this exact definition and we're just going to, how do I do this? <laughs> we're going to plug it in inside the parentheses here. Um, so at this point, I think it's worth getting a whole new board. Uh, no, I don't want to get a whole new board. I'm just going to wipe this one off. <laughs> Sorry, this is 1 a.m. humor. <laughs> Actually, no, it's Tony humor in general. <laughs> All right, I'm going to shut up and wipe the board. Okay, so I've had something hang over my head for quite a while here, and it's the expected value of the... <laughs> Sorry. Uh, anyway, so I, I've copied the function over here, and um, we are now going to just manipulate this to see where it leads us. And specifically, we're going to use this definition, this definition for this delta J thing, and we're going to see where it goes. So I'm going to... Expand this out into j minus expected value of j times the probability of that j. And now I'm just going to, so, and by the way, everything here is inside of that sigma. So everything is based on j here. Now we'll, we'll mention the, the slight difference in a moment, but in this case here, what we can do is we can distribute that probability function to each of those terms there. So this now becomes j times p of j, and we'll put brackets around this, minus that thing times that thing. And another rule here. Whenever you have a sum of differences, you can take the difference of sums. I'm not going to prove that, just accept it, um, but it might be worth kind of revi re... Well, I mean, here's the proof. You can reorder any series of sums or differences, and it exactly equals the same thing. So instead of this minus that plus that minus that plus that minus that, you can just say this plus this plus this minus 
this plus this plus this. So, so again, if you don't know what I'm saying, just accept it to be true. But it's literally just a consequence of the distribute, <laughs> the commutative property of uh, addition and subtraction. Long story short, this is exactly the same thing as j p j minus the sum of expected j times p j. So, and by the way, everything here, I'm, I'm even dropping the subscript j because it's clear we're summing over all possible values j here. Now, one thing to consider is that, well, two things. First of all, we already know exactly what that is because <laughs> we've erased it. Um, but had we not erased it, look back in your notes because when you take the summation of that variable times how likely it is to occur, that's precisely what the expected value of that is. Now, the next thing, and this is a little bit trickier, but remember that if we're summing over a whole bunch of j's, and this is where the notation is a little bit screwy here, but the expected value of j is an already known number. So no matter what index of j we're on, this, in, our, in the case of our data, is always going to be 10.05. We know what the ex expectation value of j is in our data set. So this is actually a constant. The expectation value doesn't depend on what letter we're summing because the expected value is an already known quantity. Um, now, the probability of the j's is not. So as we sum over, and, and this is why I don't love that notation. So anyway, the point is that we are multiplying a constant by every term p of j. And the reason why I say that is you can always bring out a constant from inside of a sum to outside of it. This is the distri uh, distributive law of addition. So this now looks something like this. j from that first term minus j times the sum of p of j. I, I, I hope that's clear. If it's not, it might be worth just like locking yourself in a closet and thinking real hard. <laughs> um, but I promise you this directly follows straight from the mathematical identities of addition, subtraction, and multiplication. Now, at this point, this thing here, you might be able to reason this out on your own. We're going to take the probability of all of the different options and add them together. So that alone should be enough for you to think about what that overall sum is. We'll come back to that. Uh, this is called normalization. But I want for you to directly see why this is going to equal what it equals. So I'm, I'm just going to write it down here, and then I'm going to erase it. When we take, oh, by the way, remember we had defined p of j to be n of j over n. So if I sum all of this, and I didn't leave enough room, uh, whatever, that's a backwards 3, I don't care. If I sum all of this, remember, that's a constant. So I can pull that out. 1 over n times the sum of all n j's. And do you see what this is going to equal? When we add up the number of students of every different age, this is just the total number of students. So when you take 1 over n times n, you get 1. This whole thing equals 1. And this is hopefully what you saw before, before I kind of did this. I mean, it's, it's actually a proof. Uh, it's just with sloppy handwriting. Uh, it's still a proof. <laughs> um, but so this factor is just one. And by the way, if you add up all the probabilities of all the options, you have to get one. If there's an 80% chance of rain, 20% chance of sunshine, the total probability of having a day is one. You know, that's, that's literally what that translates to. So again, there's two ways of thinking about that. There's the analytical and then the common sense way. Either way, this becomes 
expectation value of j minus expectation value of j. Hey, we got something that we don't like. At least something that doesn't help us at all. So let's take a step back and let's see why we don't like this. The question that we were asking is, how can we measure the average distance of something from the median? And here's why this equals zero. The median is defined as the thing in the middle. If you add up how far all the stuff on the left of it is, those are going to have a negative value. So the, the eights and the nines are going to have a negative deviation, and the elevens and twelves are going to have a positive deviation. And if we have properly defined what it means to be the expectation value, and, and I'm, I'm using median and expectation value a little bit loosely here, and I shouldn't be, but if we properly define the expectation value, we should have exactly the same spread on the left as the right. So if we have all the negatives, each of those is going to cancel one of the positives here, and that's why we end up with zero. We have just chosen a pretty bad way of measuring the spread because we're basically saying, <laughs> let's take the center and then cancel everything on either side of the center to get a value of zero. So there's a better way of doing this. Rather than calculate the distance on a relative scale of negative and positive, let's calculate some measure that's always going to be positive. And as you guys know, a way of turning negatives into positives rather than simply dropping that sign is by squaring them. S squaring them. So let's consider now what happens instead of taking the deviation, or, and by the way, there's not a proper term for that. I, I'm just loosely calling it deviation. But let's see what happens when we square that. 